Madam President, uh, next week the Judiciary Committee will hold its hearing on the nomination of Supreme Court, uh, to replace Supreme Court Justice John Paul Stevens. The Senate's role of advice and consent, especially for Senate court, for uh, Supreme Court justices, is one of our most important constitutional duties. I would like to just share a few thoughts about how I will approach this task. <clears throat> America's founders designed the judiciary to be, as Alexander Hamilton described it, the weakest and least dangerous branch of the government. <laughs> Things have not worked out as planned. The judiciary today is instead the most powerful and potentially the most dangerous branch of our government. Rather than being accountable to the people by being subject to the people's constitution, activist judges often make the people accountable to them by seeking to control the people's constitution. My objective in this confirmation process is to find out which kind of justice Ms. Kagan would be if confirmed to the Supreme Court. Judicial qualifications fall into two categories, legal experience and judicial philosophy. Legal experience is a summary of what a nominee has done in the past and can be described in a resume or on a questionnaire. Judicial philosophy describes how a nominee will approach the task of judging in the future. It is harder to determine, but I believe it is much more important. Let me first look at Ms. Kagan's legal experience. I have never believed that judicial experience is necessary for Supreme Court service. Or to put it another way, I've never believed it to be a disqualification uh, if you don't have judicial experience. In fact, 39 Supreme Court justices, about one-third, had no previous judicial experience. What they did have, however, was extensive experience in the actual practice of law, an average of more than 20 years. These are justices such as George Sutherland, one of my predecessors as U.S. Senator from Utah, who practiced for 23 years, or Robert Jackson, who practiced for 21 years and served as both Solicitor General and Attorney General. In other words, Supreme Court justices have had experience behind the bench as a judge, before the bench as a lawyer, or both. Ms. Kagan has neither. She spent only two years as a new associate in a large law firm. She never litigated a case or argued before any appellate court before becoming Solicitor General last year. And her work in the Clinton administration was fo focused on policy and legislation. As the Washington Post described it recently, Ms. Kagan would bring to the court experience, quote, in the political circus that often defines Washington, unquote. Some people may see little difference between the legal and the political, but I do, and am concerned about blurring the lines even further. Last week, one of my Democratic colleagues with whom I serve on the Judiciary Committee talked about Ms. Kagan's qualifications and claimed that some senators question her fitness for the Supreme Court solely because she has never been a judge. No one has made that argument. This Democratic colleague identified Justices Byron White, William Rehnquist, Louis Brandeis, and Louis Powell as among those with no prior judicial experience. Now, these justices had practiced respectively for 14, 16, 37, and 39 years in the practice of law. And Justice Powell had also been president of the American Bar Association. There really is no comparison. So in this first element of legal experience, we have to be honest about what the record shows. Unlike other Supreme Court nominees, Ms. Kagan has no judicial experience and virtually no legal practice experience. That leaves her academic and political experience. The Democratic senator I mentioned identified as among Ms. Kagan's strongest qualifications for the Supreme Court, her experience crafting policy and her ability to build consensus. Judges, however, are not supposed to be crafting policy, and consensus building only begs the question of what a consensus is being built to support. This relatively light record of legal experience only places more importance on judicial philosophy and other qualification for judicial service. Frankly, finding reliable clues about judicial philosophy is often harder in an academic and political record like Ms. Kagan's than in a judicial record. 
This is especially true when, like Miss Kagan, a nominee has rarely written directly about the topic. This does not mean that reliable clues do not exist, just that they are harder to find. I have to take Ms. Kagan's record as it is because I have to base my decision on evidence, not blind faith. Judicial philosophy refers to the process of interpreting and applying the law to decide cases. That is what judges do, but they can do it in radically different ways. Notice that I said this is about the process of deciding cases, not the results of those cases. Many people, including some of my Senate colleagues and many in the media, focus only on the results that judges reach, apparently believing that political ends justify the judicial means. That is the wrong standard for evaluating either judicial decisions or judicial nominees. Politics can focus on results, on the results, but the law must focus on the process of reaching those results. Rather than the desirable ends justifying the means, the proper means must legitimate the ends. It makes no difference which side wins, which political interest comes out on top, or whether the result can be labeled liberal or conservative. If the judge correctly interprets and applies the law in a particular case, then the result is correct. So I want to pin down as best I can what kind of justice Ms. Kagan would be. Will the Constitution control her, or will she try to control the Constitution? Will she care more about the judicial process or the political results? As I said, those clues come primarily from her record, secondarily from next week's hearing. So let me briefly focus on a few areas of Ms. Kagan's record and mention some questions that need to be answered and some concerns that need to be addressed. First, while in graduate school, Ms. Kagan wrote that the Supreme Court may overturn previous decisions, quote, on the ground that new times and circumstances demand a different interpretation of the Constitution, unquote. Not a different application, mind you, but a different interpretation. She wrote quite candidly that it is, quote, not necessarily wrong or invalid, unquote, for judges to, quote, mold and steer the law in order to promote certain ethical values and achieve certain social ends, unquote. In a 1995 Law Review at, at Law Journal article, she agreed that in most cases that come before the Supreme Court, the judge's own experience and values become the most important element in the decision. In her words, quote, many of the votes of Supreme Court just, many of the votes a Supreme Court justice casts have little to do with technical legal ability and much to do with conceptions of value, unquote. Now that sounds a lot like President Obama, who said as a senator that judges decide cases based on their own deepest values, core concerns, the depth and breadth of their empathy, and what is in their heart. If that is too results-oriented, Ms. Kagan wrote, so be it. While Ms. Kagan has not herself been a judge, those judges she has singled out for particular praise have this same activist judicial philosophy. In a tribute she wrote for her mentor, Justice Thurgood Marshall, for example, she described his judicial philosophy as driven by the belief that the role of the courts and the very purpose of constitutional interpretation is to, quote, safeguard the interests of people who had no other champion. The court existed primarily to fulfill this mission. And however much some recent justices have sniped at that vision, it remains a thing of glory, unquote. In 2006, when she was dean of Harvard Law School, Ms. Kagan praised as her judicial hero, Aaron Barak who served on the Supreme Court of Israel for nearly 30 years. 